Number one gives us three exponential functions, f, g, and h. And it wants to know which of these functions grows least quickly. So when we're looking at which one is growing least quickly, we want the smallest growth factor. And remember that the growth factor is the number attached to the variable. And so when we take a look at these, um, our lowest growth factor is f of x because the b value is the smallest, right? So three is the smallest. So then in part B, it gives us three graphs and it wants us to figure out which one represents each of those functions. So I'm just gonna write down um, A, B, and C here because those are the three graphs that we wanna match. And so when we're talking about growth factor, that means it's gonna get the highest, the quickest. So the one that's at the top here is the one that's growing the fastest. So A is growing the fastest, meaning it needs to have the largest growth factor. So A is gonna be H of X. Then the bottom one would have the lowest growth factor, which we figured out in part A was F of X. And then that leaves G of X to go with B, have the middle growth factor. And then why do all of these graphs have the same intersection point on the vertical axis? So why do they all touch right here? And that's because um, we've got the same initial value, right? So they all have 100 in here. So they all start at the same initial value. Number two wants us to match some graphs again. So in this one, you can kind of see um, by the options that they all actually have the same growth factor. So the steepness or how quick, how quickly they grow is not a distinguishing feature, um, but where they start on the vertical axis is because these are the initial values. So A is going to be the graph that is starting the lowest. And so the one that starts the lowest is M. And you can, you know, connect these over if you want to with a line. I'm just going to write the letter next to it. Um, then B is at 50. So that's the middle one. So that's going to be graph L. And then that leaves... Um, the 100 as the highest starting value, which is K. Number three, the function F is given by this equation and the function G is given by this one. The graph of F is labeled A. So this top one here is this. Maybe I'll use a highlighter instead, that might be easier. Okay, so this one is this graph up here. And then um, G of X is the graph labeled C. So that's this one down here. Then it wants us to um, determine, so for B is the graph of H and H is defined by this, what can we say about it? So um, what can we say about this graph that's in between those two? And um, what we can say about it is that it's got the same initial value, right? So they're starting at the same spot. So the A value is definitely 160. So we know that A equals 160. And then B is the growth factor, right? Or the decay factor. Um, and so we know that that's somewhere between these two. And so we know that one fifth is definitely lower than our B value. So our B value is greater than one fifth and our B value is less than four fifths. So it's somewhere between there. I don't know exactly what it is. You could just make a prediction. So you could just say, I don't know, that B could be approximately two fifths or three fifths or something like that. 
Um, I just would like to say kind of the boundary that it's in between. So it's somewhere above one fifth and lower than four fifths. Number four gives us the graph of 100 times two to the X. And it says on the same coordinate plane, sketch a graph of each of these. So let's sketch a graph of this one. So notice the similarities and differences between the one that's graphed and the one that we're graphing. So the difference is that this one's going to start at 50 instead of 100. It's going to grow at the same rate though. So what I'm going to do is just trace it because I have this technology available. And then I'm just going to go like this and move it down to 50. Then the next one is, um, so let me just duplicate this again. I'm going to change the color here. Um, so this next one, the difference between this graph and this one is that this one starts at 200. Same growth factor, so it's growing at the same rate, but now it's starting at 200. So that kind of gives you an idea of what you could do. It's the same steepness as this, just up at 200 or down at 50, depending on which one we're looking at. Number five, choose the inequality whose solution region is represented by this graph. So one thing that hopefully you notice um, right away on here is that this line is a solid line. So if it's a solid line, that means we need this equal sign under our inequality. So that rules out A and C automatically. So now we just need to figure out which of these B or D is the solution. You can go about this a bunch of different ways. Um, I'm just going to actually plug in the point zero, zero because zero, zero is not in our solution. So here's our solution set. So zero, zero should produce a false statement because it's not in our solution range. So when I plug in zero for X here, that's going to be zero because three times zero is zero. Negative four times zero is zero. So when I plug in zero, zero here, it says zero is greater than or equal to 12. And that is a false statement, meaning zero, zero is not a solution to part B. That means that that matches our graph, that we want zero, zero to, to produce a false statement. So B is actually our answer. Because if you plug zero, zero into this bottom one, okay, zero, zero, you end up with zero is less than or equal to 12, which is true. And that would mean that zero, zero needs to be in the shaded region versus when it produces a false statement, that means it's not in the shaded, which is what matches our graph. So B is the solution. Number six asks us to start with a square um, with an area of one square, which is not shown. Okay, so we don't have that one shown, so we could just draw it. So I could just draw one for you. So let me do this. So we started with this um, square, right? Then it says subdivide that square into nine squares. So if we kind of look at this, let me get us um, some lines on here to show where these nine squares are coming from. So we've got these nine squares here. So we're just subdividing it into nine squares and then we're removing one of those, right? So we're just like removing that middle piece. So the full black area is one. So once we go to this one, we've removed one out of nine pieces. So this, um, this shaded region is gonna be eight out of nine because we've got eight boxes out of nine. Now we're going to, so that's, um, what's the area of this first figure? So that's eight ninths of a unit. Now we're going to take those remaining squares in there. So these other eight squares here, and we're going to do the exact same thing. So we're going to split this up. Okay. And split each of them up into nine squares. 
So it's going to kind of look like this. And I'm just drawing these in to maybe help give you like a visual idea of how many squares there really are. Because this one was hard for me to like wrap my brain around just looking at it. So if I keep doing this. And you can see like it gets, that's an aggressive amount of squares, right? Like we've got a lot of things happening here. So let me, um, and actually let me see if I can change these. So these are your original eight boxes or nine boxes. So you can see from figure one. Okay, so there's your original boxes and now we just split them up again. Um, but so now you can kind of see that there's nine boxes on each side. So there's actually 81 boxes in this one, right? And so the amount of squares that we actually have, okay, so we had in each of these green ones, we had nine. So we had nine times eight was 72 boxes and we subtracted out these eight. Okay, so we had 72 boxes on that outer portion and we subtracted out eight, which ends up giving us 64 for these black ones out of 81. Okay, and if you can imagine, you could like count those two, um, but that's how much is left for that black region. And what ends up happening is that this is actually related to this number because eight times eight is 64. So this is actually eight squared and nine times nine is 81, whoops. So if we like write it like this instead, this is the pattern that's gonna happen. Because now we're gonna take these boxes and we're gonna split them up again. So this one, we're gonna end up with actually nine cubed boxes on the bottom there. Or if we like separated this out and like, went through the whole thing. And then you're gonna have eight cubed black ones left. So that's really the pattern. So in this fourth one, we're gonna be eight to the fourth over nine to the fourth. And so as you can imagine, as you keep going with this, um, if we had our nth figure, okay? So the nth figure that we don't know, this would be eight to the N over nine to the N. So that's a pretty hard pattern in my opinion, um, but there's, there's the pattern that's happening. So take the remaining square, subdivide it, remove the middle, what's the area of this one? And that was this second figure, and that was 64 out of 81. And then continue the process for stages um, three and four. So again, that's gonna be um, eight to the third which is five, so for stage three, that's gonna be 512 over nine cubed, which is 729. And then if we do it to the four, or for the fourth one, then that's gonna be eight to the fourth on top, which is 4,096 over nine to the fourth on bottom, which is 6,561. And then the equation, at stage n, so the area at the nth stage is gonna be equal to eight to the n over nine to the n. Then it wants you to use technology to graph this equation and figure out when it's less than half a square. So I went ahead and just graphed those dots, okay, at each spot, and then I labeled down here stage five and stage six so that you can see you know, what you actually get for an output. And that output is just by dividing those numbers. Like if I did 512 divided by um, 729, this one would be giving me 0. 0.7 about, and 4,096 divided by 6,561 gives you about 0. 0.62. So that's where these numbers are coming from. This is eight to the fifth over nine to the fifth. And this is eight to the sixth over nine to the sixth for this one. And you can see that in the sixth stage, it drops below 0.5. So when N equals six. 
All right, number seven gives us this equation, B equals 500 times 1.05 to the T, which gives us the balance of a bank account T years since it was opened. The graph shows the annual account balance for 10 years. What's the average annual rate of change? So let's take a look at um, the initial value was 500. And then let's take a look at the um, 10th year so that we can figure out um, the average. So then you'll do 500 times 1.05 to the 10th so that you can figure out that this is about $814. So now when we go to find the average rate of change, we would subtract these. So we would do 814 minus um, 500, which gives us $314. And then we would divide that by 10, okay? Which gives us um, about, 31.4 or $31 a year, something like that. And then it asks us, is this average rate of change a good measure of how the bank account varies? Now, you know, that would be connecting these dots. Let me get a better color than that. So that would be connecting from here to here just with a straight line. And in this case, it is a pretty good indicator, right? It does hit most of these dots. It's doing, um, it's pretty close. So you're not off by much. However, as time goes on, it's really not going to be because we're only seeing just a small chunk of this graph. As time goes on, that's gonna significantly change. It's going to move exponentially. So you're kind of sitting in this part right here, okay, and zoomed in on a small portion of it, and we're not seeing the whole graph. So I would say for this one, um, I would say for the first 10 years, this seems to be a pretty accurate prediction um, measure. But as time goes on, the average rate of change will be less and less um, accurate for whoops for this um, bank account model. And that's just going to be, and you know, any time you have an exponential, the average rate of change is not going to be a good indicator of the enti entirety of the graph. It's going to be able to be pretty close for portions of it, but as time goes on um, and you look at, at wider portions of the graph um, over time, it'll be less and less um, accurate.